Chapter 13, Part 1 of A History of the Philippines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alma Molino. A History of the Philippines by David Barrows. Chapter 13, Part 1. Chapter 13, America and the Philippines. Beginning of a New Era With the passing of the Spanish sovereignty to the Americans, a new era began in the Philippines. Already the old Spanish rule seems so far removed that we can begin to think of it without feeling and study it without prejudice. Development of the United States of America The American nation is the type of the New World beginning in a group of colonies planted half a century later than the settlement of the philippines it has had a development unparalleled in the history of states although peopled by emigrants from europe who rigidly preserved both their purity of race and pride of ancestry the american colonists at the end of a century were far separated in spirit and institutions from the old world Struggle with the wilderness and with the savage produced among them a society more democratic and more independent than Europe had ever known, while their profound religious convictions saved the colonists from barbarism and intellectual decline. It can truthfully be said that in 1775, at the outbreak of the American Revolution, the colonists had abler men and greater political ability than the mother country of England. It was these men who, at the close of the Revolution, framed the American Constitution, the greatest achievement in the history of public law. This nation, endowed at its commencement with so precious an inheritance of political genius, felt its civil superiority to the illiberal or ineffective governments of Europe, and this feeling has produced in Americans a supreme and traditional confidence in their own forms of government and democratic standards of life. Certainly their history contains much to justify the choice of their institutions. A hundred and twenty-five years ago, these colonies were a small nation of 2,500,000 people, occupying no more than the Atlantic coast of the continent. Great mountain chains divided them from the interior, which was overrun by the fiercest and most warlike type of man that the races have produced, the American Indian. With an energy which has shown no diminishing from generation to generation, the American broke through these mountain chains, subdued the wilderness, conquered the Indian tribes, and in the space of three generations was master of the continent of North America. Even while engaged in the war for independence, the American frontiersmen crossed the Appalachians and secured Kentucky and the Northwest Territory, and with them the richest and most productive regions of the temperate zone, the Mississippi Valley. In 1803, the great empire of Louisiana, falling from the hand of France, was added to the American nation. In 1818, Florida was ceded by Spain, and in 1848, as a result of war with Mexico, came the greater west and the Pacific seaboard. This vast dominion, nearly 3,000 miles in width from east to west, has been peopled by natural increase and by immigration from Europe, until, at the end of the 19th century, the American nation numbered 76 million souls. This development has taken place without fundamental change in the constitution or form of government, without loss of individual liberty, and with ever-increasing national prosperity. Moreover, the states have survived the Civil War, the most bloody and persistently fought war of all modern centuries, a war in which a million soldiers fell, and to sustain which three and a half billion dollars in gold were expended out of the national treasury. This war accomplished the abolition of Negro slavery, the greatest economic revolution ever effected by a single blow. Such in brief is the history of the American nation, so gifted with political intelligence, so driven by sleepless energy, so proud of its achievements, and inwardly so contemptuous of the more polished but less liberal life of the old world. Europe has never understood this nation, and not until a few years ago did Europeans dream of its progress and its power. Relation of the United States to South American Republics Toward the republics of Spanish America, the United States has always stood in a peculiar relation. These countries achieved their independence of Spain 
under the inspiration of the success of the United States. Their governments were framed in imitation of the American, and in spite of the turbulence and disorder of their political life, the United States has always felt and manifested a strong sympathy for these states as fellow republics. She has moreover pledged herself to the maintenance of their integrity against the attacks of European powers. This position of the United States in threatening with resistance the attempt of any European power to seize American territory is known as the Monroe Doctrine, because it was first declared by President Monroe in 1823. Sympathy of American People for the Oppressed Cubans the fact that the American nation attained its own independence by revolution has made the American people give ready sympathy to the cause of the revolutionist. The people of Cuba, who made repeated ineffective struggles against Spanish sovereignty, always had the good wishes of the American people. By international law, however, one nation may not recognize or assist revolutionists against a friendly power until their independence is practically effected. Thus, when rebellion broke out afresh in Cuba in 1894, the United States government actively suppressed the lending of assistance to the Cubans, as was its duty, although the American people themselves heartily wished Cuba free. The war in Cuba dragged along for years and became more and more merciless. The passions of Cubans and Spaniards were so inflamed that quarter was seldom given, and prisoners were not spared. Spain poured her troops into the island until there were 120,000 on Cuban soil, but the rebellion continued. The Spanish have always been merciless in dealing with revolutionists. Americans, on the other hand, have always conceded the moral right of a people to resist oppressive government, and in the entire history of the United States there has scarcely been a single punishment for political crime. Although probably the fiercest war in history was the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865, there was not a single execution for treason. Thus, the stories of the constant executions of political prisoners on an island in sight of its own shores greatly exasperated America, as did the policy of Governor General Whaler, which was excessive in its severity. War with Spain Destruction of the Maine as the contest proceeded without sign of termination, the patience of the American people grew less. Then, February 15, 1898, occurred one of the most deplorable events of recent times. The American battleship Maine, lying in the harbor of Havana, was in the night blown to destruction by mine or torpedo, killing 266 American officers and sailors. It is impossible to believe that so dastardly an act was done with the knowledge of the higher Spanish officials, but the American people rightly demanded that a government such as Spain maintained in Cuba, unable to prevent such an outrage upon the vessel of a friendly power, and that could neither suppress its rebellion nor wage war humanely, should cease. Declaration of War on April 20th, the American Congress demanded that Spain withdraw from the island and recognize the independence of Cuba. This was practically a declaration of war. Spain indignantly refused and resolved upon resistance. Unfortunately, the ignorant European press claimed for Spain military and naval superiority. The war was brief and was an overwhelming disaster to Spain. Every vessel of her proud navy that came under the fire of American guns was destroyed. For a few months, battle raged along the coasts of Cuba, and then Spain sued for peace. Dewey's Victory in Manila Bay But meanwhile the war, begun without the slightest reference to the Philippine Islands, had brought about surprising consequences here. At the opening of the war, both Spain and the United States had squadrons in Asiatic waters. The Spanish fleet lay at Cavite. The American ships gathered at Hong Kong. Immediately on the declaration of war, the American naval commander, Dewey, was ordered to destroy the Spanish fleet, which was feared on the Pacific coast of America. Dewey entered the Bay of Manila in darkness on the morning of May 1st, and made direct for the Spanish vessels at Cavite. His fleet was the more powerful and immeasurably the more efficient. In a few hours, the Spanish navy was utterly destroyed, and Manila lay at the mercy of his guns. A New Insurrection Under Aguinaldo At this signal catastrophe to Spain, 
the smoldering insurrection in the islands broke out afresh. The Spanish troops not in Manila were driven in upon their posts, and placed in a position of siege. The friars, so hated by the revolutionists, were captured in large numbers, and were in some cases killed. With the permission and assistance of the American authorities, Aguinaldo returned from Singapore and landed at Cavite. Here he immediately headed anew the Philippine insurrection. Capture of Manila Troops were dispatched from San Francisco for the capture of Manila. By the end of July, 8,500 men lay in the transports of Cavite. They were landed at the little estuary of Paranaque and advanced northwards upon Fort San Antonio and the defenses of Malate. The Spaniards behind the city's defenses, although outnumbering the Americans, were sick and dispirited. One attempt was made to drive back the invading army, but on the following day the Americans swept through the defenses and line of blockhouses, and Manila capitulated. August 13, 1898 The Filipinos had scarcely participated in the attack on the city, and they were excluded from occupying it after its surrender. This act was justified because the Filipino forces had been very recently raised, the soldiers were undisciplined, and had they entered the city, with passions inflamed as they were, it was feared by the Americans that their officers might not be able to keep them from looting and crime. Misunderstanding between Americans and Filipinos Up to this point, the relations between the American and Filipino armies had been friendly. But here began that misunderstanding and distrust which for so many months were to alienate these two peoples and embitter their intercourse. Provisional Government of the Filipinos In the interval between the destruction of the Spanish fleet and the capture of Manila, the Filipinos in Cavite had organized a provisional government and proclaimed the independence of the archipelago. American Ideas in Regard to the Philippines the idea of returning these islands to the Spanish power was exceedingly repugnant to American sentiment. Spain's attitude toward revolutionists was well understood in America, and the Filipinos had acted as America's friends and allies. On the other hand, the American government was unwilling to turn over to the newly organized Filipino Republic the government of the archipelago. It was felt in America, and with reason, that this Filipino government was not truly representative of all the people in the Philippines that the Filipino leaders were untried men, and that the people themselves had not had political training and experience. The United States, having overthrown the Spanish government here, was under obligation to see that the government established in its place would represent all and do injustice to none. The Filipinos were very slightly known to Americans, but their educated class was believed to be small and their political ability unproven. Thus, no assurances were given to the Filipino leaders that their government would be recognized or that their wishes would be consulted in the future of the islands. In fact, these matters could be settled only by action of the American Congress, which was late in assembling and slow to act. The Terms of Peace Spain and America were now negotiating terms of peace. These negotiations were conducted at Paris and dragged on during many critical weeks. The Filipinos were naturally very much concerned over the outcome. Finally, the American government demanded of Spain that she cede the islands to the United States and accept the sum of $20 million gold for public works and improvements which she had made. Suspicions of the Filipino Leaders These terms became known in November 1898. They served to awaken the worst suspicions of the Filipino leaders. Many believed that they were about to exchange the oppressive domination of Spain for the selfish and equally oppressive domination of America. There is reason to believe that some leaders counseled patience, and during the succeeding months made a constant effort to maintain the peace, but the radical party among the Filipinos was led by a man of real gifts and fiery disposition, Antonio Luna. He had received an education in Europe, had had some instruction in military affairs, and when in September the Filipino government was transferred to Malolos, Luna became the general-in-chief of the military forces. He was also editor of the most radical Filipino newspaper, La Independencia. New Filipino Government In 
On January 4, 1899, President McKinley issued a special message to General Otis, commanding the armies of the United States in the Philippines, declaring that American sovereignty must be recognized without conditions. It was thought in the United States that a firm declaration of this kind would be accepted by the Filipinos and they would not dare to make resistance. The intentions of the American president and nation, as subsequent events have proven, were to deal with the Filipinos with great liberality. But the president's professions were not trusted by the Filipinos, and the result of Mr. McKinley's message was to move them at once to frame an independent government and to decide on war. This new government was framed at Malolos, Bulacan, by a congress with representatives from most of the provinces of central Luzon. The Malolos Constitution was proclaimed January 23, 1899, and Don Emilio Aguinaldo was elected president. The cabinet or ministry included Don Apolinario Mabini, Secretary of State, Don Teodoro Sandico, Secretary of Interior, General Baldomero Aguinaldo, Secretary of War, General Mariano Trias, Secretary of Treasury, Don Ingracio Gonzaga, Secretary of Public Instruction and Agriculture. War with the Americans Battle of Manila The Filipino forces were impatient for fighting, and attack on the American lines surrounding Manila began on the night of February 4th. It is certain that battle had been decided upon and in preparation for some time, and that fighting would have been begun in any case before the arrival of reinforcements from America. But the attack was precipitated a little early by the killing at San Juan Bridge of a Filipino officer who refused to halt when challenged by an American sentry. On that memorable and dreadful night, the battle raged with great fury along the entire circle of defenses surrounding the city from Tondo on the north to Fort San Antonio de Abad, south of the suburb of Malate. Along three main avenues from the north, east, and south, the Filipinos attempted to storm and enter the capital. But although they charged with reckless bravery, and for hours sustained a bloody combat, they had fatally underestimated the fighting qualities of the American soldier. The volunteer regiments of the American army came almost entirely from the western United States, where young men are naturally trained to the use of arms, and are imbued by inheritance with the powerful and aggressive qualities of the American frontier. When morning broke, the Filipino line of attack had, at every point, been shattered and thrown back, and the Americans had advanced their positions on the north to Calaocan, on the east to the waterworks and the Marquina Valley, and on the south to Pasay. Declaration of War Unfortunately, during the night attack and before the disaster to Filipino arms was apparent, Aguinaldo had launched against the United States a declaration of war. This declaration prevented the Americans from trusting the overtures of certain Filipinos made after this battle, and peace was not achieved. The Malolos Campaign On March 25th began the American advance upon the Filipino capital of Malolos. This Malolos campaign, as it is usually called, occupied six days and ended in the driving of the Filipino army and government from their capital. The Filipino army was pursued in its retreat as far as Calumpit, where on the southern bank of the Rio Grande de Pampanga, the American line rested during the height of the rainy season. During this interval, the volunteer regiments, whose terms of service had long expired, were returned to the states, and their places taken by regiments of the regular army. Some hard fighting had taken place during this campaign, and two extremely worthy American officers were killed, Colonels Egbert and Stotzenberg. The American Army The American Army at that time, besides the artillery, consisted of 25 regiments of infantry and 10 of cavalry. Congress now authorized the organization of 24 new regiments of infantry, to be known as the 26th to the 49th regiments of U.S. Volunteers and one volunteer regiment of cavalry, the 11th, for a service of two years. These regiments were largely officered by men from civil life, familiar with a great variety of callings and professions, men for the most part of fine character, whose services in the months that followed were very great, not only in the field, but in gaining the friendship of the Filipino people, and in representing the character and intentions of the American government.
Anti-War Agitators in America Through the summer of 1899, the war was not pressed by the American general, nor were the negotiations with the Filipino leaders conducted with success. The Filipinos were by no means dismayed. In spite of their reverses, they believed the conquest of the islands impossible to foreign troops. Furthermore, the war had met with tremendous opposition in America. Many Americans believed that the war was against the fundamental rights of the Filipino people. They attacked the administration with unspeakable bitterness. They openly expressed sympathy for the Filipino revolutionary cause, and for the space of two years, their encouragement was an important factor in sustaining the rebellion. Spread of the Insurrection In these same summer months, the revolutionary leaders spread their cause among the surrounding provinces and islands. The spirit of resistance was prominent at first only among the Tagalogs, but gradually nearly all the Christianized population was united in resistance to the American occupation. Occupation of Negros The Americans had meanwhile occupied Iloilo and the Bisayas, and shortly afterwards the Presidios in Mindanao surrendered by the Spaniards. In Negros, also, exceptional circumstances had taken place. The people in this island invited American sovereignty, and General James Smith, sent to the island in March as governor, assisted the people in forming a liberal government, through which insurrection and disorder in that island were largely avoided. Death of General Luna With the cessation of heavy rains, the fighting was begun again in northern Luzon. The Filipino army had its headquarters in Tarlac, and its lines occupied the towns of the provinces of Pangasinan and Nueva Ecija, stretching in a long line of posts from the Zambales Mountains almost to the upper waters of the Rio Pampanga. It was still well-armed, provisioned, and resolute, but the brilliant, though wayward, organizer of this army was dead. The nationalist junta, which had directed the Philippine government and army, had not been able to reconcile its differences. It is reported that Luna aspired to a dictatorship. He was killed by soldiers of Aguinaldo at Cabanatuan. The Campaign in Northern Luzon The American generals now determined upon a strategic campaign. General MacArthur was to command an advance up the railroad from Calumpit upon Tarlac. General Lawton, with a flying column of swift infantry and cavalry, was to make a flanking movement eastward through Nueva Ecija and hem the Filipino forces in upon the east. Meanwhile, General Wheaton was to convey a force by transport to the Gulf of Lingayen to throw a cordon across the Ilocano coast that should cut off the retreat of the Filipino army northward. As a strategic movement, this campaign was only partially successful. MacArthur swept northward, crushing the Filipino line on his front, his advance being led by the active regiment of General J. Franklin Bell. Lawton's column scoured the country eastward, marching with great rapidity and tremendous exertions. Swollen rivers were crossed with great loss of life, and the column, cutting loose from its supplies, was frequently in need of food. It was in this column that the Filipino first saw with amazement the great American cavalry horse, so large beside the small pony of the Philippines. Lawton's descent was so swift that the Philippine government and staff narrowly escaped capture. On the night of November 11th, the Filipino generals held their last council of war at Bayambang on the Rio Agno and resolved upon dispersal. Meanwhile, Wheaton had landed at San Fabian, upon the southern Ilocano coast, but his force was insufficient to establish an effective cordon, and on the night of November 15th, Aguinaldo, with a small party of ministers and officers, closely pursued by the cavalry of Lawton under the command of General Young, slipped past through the mountains of Pozorubio and Rosario, and escaped up the Ilocano coast. Then began one of the most exciting pursuits in recent wars. The chase never slackened, except in those repeated instances when, for the moment, the trail of the Filipino general was lost. From Candon, Aguinaldo turned eastward through the commandanchas of Lepanto and Bontoc into the wild Igorot country of the Cordillera Central. The trail into Lepanto leads over the lofty mountains through the precipitous Tila Pass. Near the summit, in what was regarded as an impregnable position, Gregorio del Pilar, little more than a boy, but a brigadier general, with a small force of soldiers, 
the remnant of his command, attempted to cover the retreat of his president. But a battalion of the 33rd Infantry, under Major March, carried the pass, with the total destruction of Pilar's command, he himself falling amid the slain. Capture of Aguinaldo Major March then pursued Aguinaldo into Bontoc and then southward into the wild and mountainous territory of Giangan. On Christmas night, 1899, the American soldiers camped on the crest of the Cordillera, within a few miles of the Igorot village where the Filipino force was sleeping. Both parties were broken down and in dire distress through the fierceness of the fight and pursuit, but for several weeks longer, Aguinaldo's party was able to remain in these mountains and elude its pursuers. A month later, his trail was finally lost in the valley of the Cagayan. He and his small party finally passed over the exceedingly difficult trail through the Sierra Madre Mountains to the little Tagalog town of Palanan near the Pacific coast. Here, almost entirely cut off from active participation in the insurrection, Aguinaldo remained until March of 1901, when he was captured by the party of General Funston. For some weeks following the disintegration of the Filipino army, the country appeared to be pacified and the insurrection over. The new regiments arriving from the United States, an expedition was formed under General Schwann, which in December and January marched southward through Cavite and Laguna provinces and occupied Batangas, Dayabas, and the Camarines. Other regiments were sent to the Visayas and to northern Luzon until every portion of the archipelago, except the islands of Mindoro and Palawan, contained large forces of American troops. Reorganization of the Filipino Army the Filipinos had, by no means, however, abandoned the contest, and this period of quiet was simply a calm while the insurgent forces were perfecting their organization and preparing for a renewal of the conflict under a different form. It being found impossible for a Filipino army to keep the field, there was effected a secret organization for the purpose of maintaining irregular warfare through every portion of the archipelago. The islands were partitioned into a great number of districts, or zones. At the head of each was a zone commander, usually with a rank of general. The operations of these men were, to a certain extent, guided by the counsel or directions of the secret revolutionary juntas in Manila or Hong Kong, but in fact they were practically absolute and independent, and they exercised extraordinary powers. They recruited their own forces and commissioned subordinate commanders. They levied contributions upon towns, owners of haciendas, and individuals of every class, and there was a secret civil or municipal organization for collecting these revenues. The zone commanders, moreover, exercised the terrible power of execution by administrative order. End of chapter 13, part 1. Recording by Alma Molino.